Hello, everyone. We would like to reintroduce to the world the perfect law of liberty. That is the Bible from God that will free men from every wind of doctrine of men. So the New Testament of the perfect law of liberty. You're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus promised. That's just the truth he promised is the perfect law of liberty. Now, many people are now realizing that we are in the spiritual dark ages because we're suffering in the matrix of subjective truth of men. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 tells us plainly that we are in, in apostasy. That's a great falling away or apostasy. We couldn't understand that before now, though, because God gave to us a strong delusion. This was a covert operation by God for 1,680 years. We were in apostasy. However, some of us have known this because in the covert operation, you have to have people working behind the scenes. Some of us have known this, and we've been preparing now for 40 years. Foreshadowed by Cyrus the Great, Donald J. Trump has been leveling the Gnostic battlefield. Though our Lord is not willing that any should perish, he's too jealous to call Gnosticism Christianity. And so Christianity is going to reboot. And in about 40 years later, the Lord will no longer hide his face from humanity, Ezekiel 39, 25 through 29. The building of the second temple of Jerusalem in 530 BC foreshadowed the restoration of the perfect law of liberty. And so this restoration project for the Bible from God is going to be completed. And the second age of the kingdom will begin in about 40 years, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. Micah 7, 15. Are you willing to trust the Lord God Almighty that he will give us the truth that will free us from the doctrine of men? John 8, 32. Romans 3 and verse 4. Can you believe that the will of the Lord will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Believe it or not, the kingdom of God will consume and destroy every Gnostic kingdom of men. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And a possible question here from these weak and faith Christians who are asking about spiritual warfare was, well, should we accept the man back whom we delivered to Satan? So the Holy Spirit speaking through the tongue or pen of Paul, using Paul's emotions and feelings, says, but I determined this for myself, that I would not come again to you with sorrow. For if I make you sorry, who then is he that makes me glad? But he that made sorry by me. For if I make you sorry, who then is he that makes me glad? But he that is made sorry by me. As I wrote this very thing, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. In other words, he wrote that they dealt with this man who was trying to worship in pagan temples as well as in the church because he had, in the pagans, he was, remember, with his father's wife, a prostitute in the temple, most likely. They said he can't do both. And so you need to deal with this man. Deliver him to Satan. In other words, let him worship with the pagans. But anyway, he wrote this so he wouldn't have to deal with it. The Holy Spirit wrote it, but Paul was glad it was given this way instead of him going in person and having to deal with this and, and being made sorry. And I wrote this very thing, lest when I come, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is a joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be made sorry, but that you might know the love that I have more abundantly unto you. And if any have caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in part that I press not too heavily to you all. Sufficient to such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the many. So in other words, he didn't want to have to deal with this thing in person. And so it was dealt with by the Holy Spirit in pen, through Paul's pen or his tongue. And so now uh, the man's been dealt with. And he said, it's enough. It's enough already. So that contrary wise, you should rather forgive him and comfort him, lest by any means such a one should be swallowed up with his overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you to confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you are obedient in all things. 
but to whom you forgive anything, I forgave also. For what I also have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything for your sakes, have I forgiven it in the presence of Christ, that no advantage may be gained over us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So, of course, in denominationalism, in Gnosticism, uh, in faith systems of men, we it's, it's not a big issue to worship with other denominations, is it? I mean, uh, especially if you can find people that are righteous uh, to worship with. But uh, it's, uh, it's not a big deal. But that's not going to be the case. And when Christ has all authority in the kingdom of heaven, and we're working toward that. We're learning how to get there. So we need to learn matters of, of fellowship. We can't have fellowship with evil works of darkness. Again, can we still have fellowship with denominationalists? Yes, until we see the day approaching. Remember Hebrews 10, 25, until the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it gets to the point where when we can no longer associate with them. So that's what was happening here. He certainly, certainly this wasn't the denomination, this was a pagan religion and it was evil. And they couldn't have anything to do with it. Maybe ever, certainly not ever did they want to have anything to do with it. But, you know, we, uh, we have had similar things in denominationalism, right? What about the Catholic Church and the teaching that, that children are born in sin so that evil men in the Catholic Church can abuse children? You see, could we have had fellowship with them, some of them that weren't involved in that kind of thing? Yes. But now we have to completely, there will be a time when the kingdom of heaven gets here. We'll have to completely get away from all that kind of stuff. But to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also for what I have, for what I also have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything for your sakes, have I forgiven it in the presence of Christ that no advantage may be gained over us by Satan? For we are not ignorant of his devices. So again, the doctrine of men, Satan, denominationalism, Gnosticism is, is a doctrine of men. And again, we had no choice but to be involved in it before. And that's why we could associate with righteous Gnostics. But uh, that's going to be... It's going to be done. So what's the device of Satan? Well, Gnosticism. I mean, that's his device, the doctrine of men. That's that's what he wanted. Remember in the Garden of Eden, uh, he, uh, you know, tempted men. What did he say? In the doctrine of men, subjective truth. That's his devices. So God said, you will surely die. And he said, you will not surely die. Remember, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So again, Christian warfare to prepare for the kingdom is between objective truth and and subject to the men, Satan's devices. It's, he twisted truth, Genesis 3, 4. Now back to the Holy Spirit, or speaking through Paul. Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and then a door was opened unto me in the Lord, I had no relief for my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went forth into Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us triumphantly in Christ, and makes manifest through us the savor of his knowledge in every place. For we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God in them that are saved and in them and in them that perish. To the one a fragrance of death unto death, to the other a fragrance of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as the many corrupting the word of God. Just like right now, most people in the world are, are Gnostics. Again, we can have it. We're coming out of Gnosticism. Is. We're coming out of Gnosticism now, but many are corrupting the word of God. Standing between God and, and man, that's corrupting the word of God. Remember, remember. I mean, we were in ignorance and we couldn't know these things. But remember uh, the Septuagint, the denominational Bible of, of men, they changed the meaning of the word uh, Elohim from, from plural to singular, where Christ was not included in the Bible. That's what, how they had the authority to crucify him, because they corrupted the word of God. So, so the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul, and this is Paul's emotions involved here. For we are not as the many corrupting the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ, in or for Christ. Uh, you know, you've heard of speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. That's, that's what we find. And that's what we're working toward. Christ will have all authority. And that's what we we speak for his authority and the things that he wants, not our opinions, not our subjective truth. Any longer. Now, notice that subjective truth, even if someone agrees with God. So let's take uh, abortion, for example. Somebody says, 
if somebody believes abortion is wrong because babies are cuter than puppies, it's still subjective truth. And we should believe abortion is wrong because murder's wrong, because God says it's wrong, because we love God and we want to keep his commandments. We, we know his ways are the best. Of course, we agree that murder is wrong, but we don't come up with a different reason for saying it's wrong than what God does. We have to do the right things for the right reasons. We have to know that God is protecting us and taking care of us. He wants the best for humanity. And so we, we uh, don't put subjective truth in anything morally speaking. We take God's word on it. Christ will rule over this earth in the second age of the kingdom of heaven. 